Give it up for Brian. Thank you. So I think one of the most critical things about uh, I learned from the Army is you never stand between the masses and lunch or food breaks. So <laughs> I'll try to keep my comments brief. And thanks for that kind introduction. Um, that'll segue with some of the things we'll discuss. You know, really, I'm fortunate to be part of a, a broader team with, with Wake Sports Medicine. We have got a great group of primary care sports medicine, uh, athletic trainers, physical therapists, and then my orthopedic surgeon uh, partners. Uh, really, we're dedicated towards taking care of the athletes of all, all types, really. The cyclist is one that's near and dear to my heart, and our facilities over at, uh, at 1901 Mooney, where Sports Medicine Stratford is uh, it's really a great location and it's designed to, to take care of all the athletes, young, old, weekend warrior, which I consider myself these days. And we really try to leverage some of our community partners like Chris Paul and our, our trainers within the school. So thank you. You know, it's an incredible honor. It's been a great year. I'm relatively newer to the, uh, to the Winston community and it's been a great opportunity to get involved with, with uh, Wake Athletics with men's and women's soccer, cover football, I'll be there tomorrow, um, doing some of the tennis events like the Winston-Salem Open, and, uh, and then also covering Wake Baseball and the Winston-Salem Dash. So it's a great opportunity. If you ever see me just slumming it on the sidelines, feel free to come and say hello. Um, but ultimately, uh, my, my adventure is really in my, my foray into the cycling world started in El Paso. It's about 350 days of sunshine a year. It's a fairly desolate place. There's not a ton to do, but there's a lot of open road. And so you really can, can dive in. And uh, this was home for, for 10 years. Far West Texas It's pretty much as far west as you can go. It's kind of like that book where the sidewalk ends. That's, uh, that's El Paso. And it's great single track country. I mean, if you wanna do road biking, if you wanna do mountain terrain, if you wanna do stuff that's relatively risk averse, all of it's there for you. So that's where I first got a love for, for uh, biking. And uh, my bike traveled with me everywhere. We went to Afghanistan, I put in my carry-on, we put it on trainers, and, and that's the way you would burn some of your energy uh, in the 140 degree heat. And from there, we went to Chicago, and so, uh, you know, that uh, uh, was a little bit more of an urban single track country, but uh, good rides all the while, and you can go all, around, all the way around the Great Lakes. So pretty cool. So it's just a little bit of cosmic energy that when I was looking for jobs as I was getting out of the Army, that uh, Winston-Salem came on the radar, and it just so happens it's the home of the National Cycling Center and a really rich biking community, both uh, just recreational, and then uh, also professional and very competitive. So what I'll, I'll kind of bring up with you all today is, is talk a little bit about the musculoskeletal injuries that can happen, most specifically uh, uh, one uh, injury within cycling. And uh, the common myth is that cycling injuries don't occur or they, they don't occur at the high level. It only happens to people that are inexperienced. But I think we all remember this injury in the GIF, yeah, we'll play where uh, Mark Cavendish is uh, gently nudged out of the course of uh, competition, and uh, uh, I declare that that's false. We see uh, an abundance of biking-related injuries. Uh, it can account for up to 40% of the 4.4 million uh, sports-related injuries, second only to, quote-unquote, riding animals, like horseback riding. It generates 1.2 million uh, physician visits, over a half million, uh, ED visits, emergency room. There are 23,000 hospital admissions and over 900 deaths, a lot of which are related to closed head injuries and uh, systemic injuries. So those are really the facts. Uh, there are a broad variety of injuries, both overuse and traumatic, and the ones we'll kind of key on are mostly the musculoskeletal and uh, specifically upper extremity injuries. Dr. Codman is one of our kind of our forefathers within upper extremity surgery, and, and uh, he's he's quoted or attributed this quote: uh, "We're proud that our brains are more developed than animals, but we might also boast our clavicles." And so, clavicles have a uh, storied history within the biking community. Uh, certainly, uh, uh, none other than Lance Armstrong sustained a clavicle injury before his fall from grace 
and uh, subsequently had fixation of it and it was very well publicized. And this New York Times bestseller piece says, for cyclists, collarbones are made to be broken and then often subsequently fixed. So we're seeing a lot of these mid-shaft clavicle fractures because it's inevitable that during the course of your, your, your cycling, you can go over the handlebars, you usually land directly on the shoulder and fracture your collarbone. So what's the, the, the function of the collarbone? Ultimately, it's a pretty key critical part with power, stability, and overall positioning of the arm. It is really an intricate uh, role in, in the motions of the shoulder girdle, as we would call it. It both rotates and it's got this angled uh, uh, trajectory. It serves as the uh, uh, foundation of many different muscle attachments. It protects our, our nerves and our arteries. Also has a key role in respiratory function and keeping our, uh, our thorax full. You can see if you look at it from the top down, the front view, it's not a straight bone. It's a, got a very curvilinear kind of S-shaped uh, configuration and it serves as the strut between our, our rib cage and our, and our shoulder girdle. And it really is what prevents us from, from slouching excessively and maintaining a biomechanically advantageous position of our shoulder. This is what it looks like if you were to remove the skin. It's a 3D rendering of all the muscles and, and soft tissue attachments. And you can see it occupies a fairly subcutaneous or, or, or immediately beneath the skin position. Um, clavicle fractures, what's the incidence of it? It probably comprises about 4% of all fractures in adults and about 35% or a third uh, in the uh, shoulder region. It's second only to proximal humerus fractures. And within those, about 80% of those are involving the mid shaft or the middle portion of the collarbone. About 50% of those will be displaced, meaning they're not in continuity with each other. And uh, people see it and feel it. So it's not a very subtle injury. The good news is the broader majority of these, at least traditionally, have been managed conservatively. And why is this relevant in the cycling community? Well. It's among elite athletes. Uh, uh, they looked at the Tour de France over an eight year time frame and over 1,500 athletes. Uh, there were 260 approximately uh, withdrawals. About half of those were due to acute injuries. Of those, 49% of these were due to fractures and clavicles were the most common. How does this figure in with uh, uh, mountain biking? You're looking at the, the rates of mountain bike related injuries. There are about 217 over this 10 year time frame. And of those, upper extremity fractures, proximal humerus and, and, and clavicle among wrist and others uh, were the most common. And so again, this is not a subtle finding. You can see this fairly bad bruise. And most of these you can pick up on just history exam alone. But we use special x-ray views in order to try to quantify the degree of displacement and try to predict how these are going to behave over time. Sometimes CT scans can be helpful also to rule out rib fractures uh, or displacement and kind of the fracture personality, so to speak. This is my pretty characteristic military population. It's a walking billboard for uh, America, as, uh, as you all would know it as. Um, but oftentimes, non-operative treatment can be used for minimally displaced or, or, or settled fractures. And oftentimes, even if they heal in a slightly shortened position, it's of minimal consequence. You just notice a bump uh, when they have their shirt off. Um, non-operative treatment typically includes this figure of eight brace or sling. Both are quite functional. It's important to try to maintain the normal posture of the scapula so you don't develop down steep problems with, uh, with the, the shoulder blade dysfunction. Um, and again, the broader majority of these will heal, but there's 15% 15 or so that may not fully heal. Um, so they may either heal in a less than ideal position or they cannot heal at all. And, uh, that's typically associated with high degrees of displacement, a lot of overlapping, what we call bayonet apposition, or shortening of the clavicle or strut. When you look at these at long-term 10-year follow-up, again, you see that 46% of these individuals had less than ideal uh, outcomes, and 7% and in this study had non-union failure to heal. The strongest predictors of that, again, no bony contact, a lot of comminution that's breaking up into a lot of different pieces of the bone and more elderly or physiologically old individuals. Um, so the, the complications uh, are these that we've mentioned, but also you can have uh, impaling your, your nerves or your arteries, uh, and there can also be cosmetic concerns as a result of that too. So there's this growing body of literature that's just 
perhaps maybe we should be fixing more of these. And a lot of these came to light after Lance Armstrong's injury, truthfully. Um, Non-union, again, can, can run the, the gamut, but uh, is estimated to be between 6.2% uh, up to 15%. And again, these are the risk factors that we described. So surgical decision making, what, what do we do? How do we get there? Where do we interpret all these signals? Well, these are the, uh, the individuals that are pretty much the no-brainers with collarbone fixation. You can see anyone with a nerve or an artery injury, those with open fractures, meaning it's poking through the skin, those that have risk for being an open injury, you can see in that bottom right image where you can see it's almost poking through that, uh, that small thin veil of soft tissue there. Those individuals with a lot of different injuries, so we're trying to mobilize to a, a, a more functional position, lower extremity injuries, shoulder, wrist. When you have combined injuries, it's better to treat those operatively because it gets them back to function earlier. Those with significant displacement, and those with involvement of, of many of the different uh, supporting structures around the shoulder. So the surgical approach is pretty straightforward. It's really just a dissection, usually from, from outside to inside, overlying that, dissecting down over the, the nerves and being cautious uh, to avoid those pertinent structures. You can see there are definitely tigers in this neighborhood. These are the blood vessels and uh, the nerves, most of which we just dissect around in order to try to reconstitute that, that native anatomy. There's a lot of different ways you can fix it, both uh, pins or rods that go within the, the collarbone, as well as these plates that either go on top or in front. And typically, you're just trying to have this serve as rebar until the, uh, until the bone fully heals, which it pretty reliably does. Very low rate of non-union and uh, high rates of these going on to heal at a pretty reasonable time frame, somewhere around 10 weeks. You can see when you use the, uh, the, the pin implants, those have to come out a little bit more often, about 70%. Most plate fixations at most is somewhere between 15 to 20% and a high rate of satisfaction. You can see these are kind of some examples of, of other ways to fix it. You see that plate just serving as the strut to hold that clavicle out to length and those little small screws holding the, the, the bony pieces together. You can see again these small case series showing that by about three months you're pretty reliably healed and uh, have a tendency to uh, be able to regain full function and be quite happy and satisfied. Again, more pictures just showing these classic injury patterns that we continue to see. The best injury, uh, I'm sorry, the best treatment is, is truthfully it's the, the injury prevention side. And so there are a lot of different things we can do as a biking community and also among our kids and young people because they comprise probably upwards of 27 million uh, uh, bike passengers on, on any given year. Um, helmets has probably been one of the most, most critical changes in an advocacy platform, and that has reduced the rate of closed head injury by upwards of 85%. Gloves or other skin protectant are important to prevent abrasions, which truthfully are among the most common injuries. Eye protectant are important, padded shorts, for any, uh, any folks in the room that have ever not felt their lower extremities after a long ride, uh, padded shorts is a game changer. Shoes, uh, using reflective or bright clothing, uh, lights or strobes, particularly in a di uh, dark environment um, when, you're, when you're doing it either at the beginning or later into the day. Uh, ultimately, from a, from a community advocacy standpoint, it's trying to, to make the road a little bit more friendly, establish bike lanes, paths, green spaces that we can all utilize. And that's what I love about the Winston community is that really that is being prioritized across the board. So with that, I'll just leave that as kind of a, a cursory overview of clavicle fractures. Before you change it. Yeah. I'm surprised I don't see lightweight shoulder protection out there. Yeah. Does that exist? It does not to my knowledge anyways. Uh, Even in non-biking, they don't have well, so you see that in motocross, but I have not seen that broadly utilized in, in mountain biking or single tracks. I don't know. Has anybody else seen that? Yeah. yeah. But it's still, it's still not to protect your clavicle. It's to protect, protect your neck and back. Yeah. That's the most protection stuff I've seen. And, like, actually elbow, elbow pads, knee pads, but, like, there's no... To my knowledge, there's not something that will like really prevent your yeah. clavicle from fracturing if you hit it right. It's just like, yeah, it's like it's way you hit it in the right angle and it's just gone. Yeah. 
but good question. I mean, obviously things that we hear about. The other injury that we didn't mention, uh, but, but could have gone into depth about is AC separations. We see a lot of AC separations as a result. If you land right here, you catch it right, the soft tissue ligaments will allow that collarbone to just pop up. And that's oftentimes misinterpreted as a, a shoulder dislocation, but it's actually the end of your collarbone popping through the soft tissue and uh, um, those are injuries that are very common in our football and other contact athletes. We manage conservatively, but we place a donut or a small soft tissue protector on that when they go back to competition. And they can get back anywhere between seven and 16 days after that type of injury. You imagine that's like a spearing tackle that they contact the shoulder. So there are some commonalities between the two. Uh, and that's a circumstance where you, we do use a little bit more padding. Other questions? Well, thank you, obviously, and uh, please feel free to contact me at any point in time. I'd be remiss if I didn't uh, mention how to get in touch with us. We, we have uh, um, all ways uh, of patients to, to get in touch with us. We can uh, either do it through our access center. Um, we have uh, weekend clinics, so if you do have athletes that need care uh, on the weekends, we have those available on Saturday mornings. We have same-day appointments available. We have locations in Greensboro. High Point, uh, Winston, uh, so we're really we're we're dedicated to, to the care of all athletes, and happy to be a resource to y'all. Thanks.